as my colleagues announced at the end of the previous video, we are going to take another look at a country that has been mentioned before. Egypt. Earlier, you already learned about ancient garden deities worshipped during pharaonic times. And this week, you have met with angels and demons in ancient Mesopotamia. With all this new background knowledge, you are now ready to travel through time, to zoom in on more recent periods and to learn about the confrontation between good and evil in the religious landscape of Egypt today, from the times when Christianity and then Islam gradually replaced the ancient Egyptian religion. And the first thing to note here is that today, while the vast majority of Egyptians are Muslim, a significant part of the population is Christian. And, in fact, this Christian community is still the largest Christian community in the Middle East. These Christians are called Copts, a word that literally means Egyptians and is derived from the Greek word Aegyptios, Egyptian. This word was adapted into the Arabic word Qipti when the Arabs conquered the region in the 7th century. As all Egyptians were Christians at this point, the word Qipti got the secondary meaning of Christian. And this secondary meaning remained after a significant part of the population had converted to Islam. From that point onwards, Qipti meant Egyptian, Christian, Egyptian Christians. Copts are one of the oldest Christian communities in the world, since they believe that the Apostle Mark himself brought them Christianity. Also, archaeologists have been able to identify evidence of a Christian presence in Egypt that reaches back to the 1st century. The existence of demons has always been a widespread belief among Copts. These are evil spirits, servants of the devil, that relentlessly torment humans. They are manifested in two different patterns. A demon could take control of or possess a person, or a demon could be present as a monstrous being embodied to torment a person. As we have seen earlier on this week, this is also true for the Mesopotamian de demons discussed there. As for the first pattern, the possession of an individual, the Coptic Orthodox Church, like any church in the world, has a very specific procedure that people trust to be effective in getting rid of the demon. It is called exorcism, and it has its roots in the Bible, more precisely in the New Testament, where we find many instances of Christ casting out demons. Today, some Coptic priests are very popular exorcists. They perform exorcism in public in a very impressive fashion. The possessed individual screams, cries and violently moves before being finally freed from the spirit thanks to the prayers and blessings of the priests. One of the most famous priests in Egypt today is probably Father Makari Yunan, whom you can see practicing in this video clip. <laughs> Another very prominent religious personality in Egypt is Fadu Samaran. Every week, he performs spiritual healing by driving out evil spirits and the people who gather in his big church at the Muqattam site very much believe in this. And in these crowds, you find not only Coptic Christians but Muslims as well. They are often women, but not exclusively, and they ask for the priest's help when they are convinced that they are possessed by a demon. Please remember this priest, Father Samaran. We will meet him again in the last week of our MOOC, which will be devoted to Cairo, where he lives. As for the second pattern, the presence of demons, it is a very common aspect of the traditional religious literature of the Copts, which reaches back to late antiquity and the Middle Ages and is still widely read today. This pattern concerns the fight of an individual, often a monk, against a demon, a monstrous incarnation standing next to him and violently tormenting him. Again, this pattern has its roots in the biblical exile of Christ in the desert. There, after days of prayer and fasting, he encounters Satan, the devil himself, 
who taunts him by saying that if he really is the son of God, he should be able to change some stones into bread and feed himself. Likewise, the first monks in Egypt took the decision to live in the desert as hermits, alone, away from cities, in order to imitate Christ. Life in the desert is a way to detach oneself from the world and reach God through a simple and humble life. Now, it must be noted that these Egyptian monks, attested as early as the 3rd century, were actually the first monks in the world. It is in Egypt that monasticism was developed. First, there were hermits who lived on their own, in all but total isolation, and later, groups of such hermits gathered together to shape brand new monastic communities. Tradition has it that Anthony the Great were the first hermit to assemble a community under his leadership. Later, the monastic movement was reformed by Pacomius and slowly but steadily reached Europe, where it further developed. Also, what cannot help thinking that the fact that monasticism appeared precisely in the Egyptian desert might be connected with the fact that, in the unique landscapes of Egypt, the desert is never far away. Just one look at any picture of the Nile Valley makes this statement easily understandable. The greenery is suddenly broken by the desert sands and stones. One does not need usually more than a few steps to be all alone in the desert. So, could this proximity explain why Egyptians actually invented the monastic way of life? In the religious literature from Egypt about these early monks, we encounter numerous narratives in which these men are said to have encountered and been tormented by evil spirits in the desert, just like Christ before them. The most famous comes from the life of Saint Anthony, which was written in the 4th century by Athanasius of Alexandria, one of the so-called Church Fathers. In this narrative, Anthony engages in, in, in a trip into the desert in order to meet another hermit. Along the way, he is tempted many times by demonic artifacts like fake gold and money and tormented by numerous demons. These episodes have been a source of inspiration for painters throughout ages, from Bosch to Dali, and, and even for writers such as Gustave Flaubert. Another example of the fight of a monk against demons comes from the Apophthegmata Patrum, a collection of sayings of the Desert Fathers, originally composed in Greek around the 5th century. An ascetic, Having found someone possessed by the devil and unable to fast and being moved by the love of God and seeking not his own good but the good of the other, prayed that the devil might pass into himself and that the other might be liberated. God heard his prayer. The ascetic, overwhelmed by the devil, gave himself with redoubled insistence to fasting, prayer and ascesis. At last, because of his charity, God drove the devil away from him after a few days. Sometimes also these demons are connected to the pagan beliefs of ancient Egyptians and these narratives also are also a way to claim the superiority of the church over the gods and practices of the ancients. So, as you can see, Christianity and later Islam replaced the ancient Egyptian beliefs, but that does not mean that all of those were immediately and completely forgotten. Take the following example. One day, Abba Macarius went up from Cetis to Terenuthis and went into the temple to sleep. Now, there were some old coffins of the pagans there. Taking one, he put, in, he put it under his head as a pillow. The devils, seeing his audacity, were filled with jealousy and to make him afraid, they called out as though addressing a woman. So and so come to bath with us. With us. Another devil replied from beneath him as though among the dead, I have a stranger on top of me and I cannot come. But the old man was not afraid. On the contrary, he knocked on the coffin with assurance, saying, Awake and go in the darkness, if you can. 
Hearing this, the devils began to cry out with all their might, You have overcome us! Filled with confusion, they fled. For some people reading these narratives today, the demons are very real. Indeed, since the composition of the early ancient Egyptian cosmogonies that you encountered earlier on, the Egyptian desert has always been considered as chaos, a hostile place full of demons. And, as a consequence, it is the perfect place to meet and fight them. For others, and it is somehow related, the demons are personifications of passions that any monk is obliged to renounce in order to live in proper monastic conditions. These demons regularly come back to him to tempt and torment him. To conclude, the last thing to remember is that these beliefs concerning demons have been present in Egypt for a very long time. Nowadays, they are shared by a large part of the Egyptian population, whether Christian or Muslim. This also brings us to the end of the first two weeks of this course in which you have learned about gods, spirits, angels and demons in various oriental beliefs. Next week, we will see how these same belief systems view what happens after a person dies and how various groups of believers have expressed these ideas by using such concepts as netherworld and afterlife. Mm -hmm.